Hello everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our online training today. Uh, if you're joining us on Zoom and you have any questions, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen, wherever your Zoom controls are, hit that Q&A button, and then it'll pop up in a new window. You can type in your question there, and I will get to those at the end of the information tonight. Uh, if you're watching us live on YouTube, please feel free to watch the live chat or type into the live chat if you have any questions. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, not on a live stream, then uh, well, the, the live chat won't be available, but I guess you could leave us a comment. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell too to make sure and you hit that thumbs up as well. Uh, so my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department the last eight years, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before that, it was a uh, couple years as a uh, diagnostic sales rep of Snap-on. Uh, so I had 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Before that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I was a diagnostic technician at a Subaru dealership, or should I say I became a diagnostic technician as I, as I went on. Uh, always ended up getting those drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would crop up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all these weird situations that seemed to end up in my bay. Then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs been about 25 years plus experience for me. So tonight's topic is module setup. Uh, we're going to talk about coding, programming, flashing, how these terms are often used interchangeably. They do not mean the same thing. And we're going to talk about the differences between these as well as resets and relearns to go along with it. Because if you think about out in the industry nowadays, if you talk to people, there, there does seem to be uh, at least a little bit of confusion there. So what does this mean? What does a reset mean? What does a relearn? Coding, programming, flashing, especially programming and flashing, those seems to be interchanged an awful lot. Uh, so we're going to hopefully try and get some of the uh, confusion out of this uh, and, and hopefully make it a little bit more clear for you tonight. It's what we're trying to do. Uh, so first, let's start with resets. Resets are, I would say, the simplest of these. Uh, they're used to reset a parameter back to factory specifications. A couple examples you might see out there is oxygen sensor heater or maybe transmission shift adaptives. So all this does is we're going to go in and usually it's just a little button that says reset on the screen and it resets whatever the computer default program is. Uh, so for example, on that oxygen sensor heater, we talk about this quite a bit, but 06 and newer GM vehicles. On their oxygen sensors, they went with what they call a resistance compensating oxygen sensor heater circuit. When that sensor is brand new, the resistance is in the heater circuit is set at wherever it's set at. And uh, the amperage required to get that up to temperature is not all that much. As it heats up, cools off, heats up, cools off, heats up, cools off. Over time, every time it cycles, that resistance is gonna increase just a little bit over time. As it is increasing, the computer learns that it needs to increase the amperage flowing through that circuit in order to keep the temperature the same and in order to keep the element heating up as quickly as it's supposed to. So over time, it creeps up and creeps up and creeps up, and eventually, you know, it gets to a point where that sensor is going to fail for one reason or another. When the sensor does fail, you're going to replace it with a brand new one, right? And then when you put the brand new one in, well, the resistance is back down to where a brand new one would be. But the resistance or the, or the uh, amperage due to the old resistance and the old oxygen sensor is considerably higher now. So this low resistance heater is being fed a ton of amperage and when it does, eventually pretty quickly, usually we hear in the first few hundred miles, it'll burn out the heater element and then you have to replace it again until finally maybe it learns, but doing the reset saves you from that trouble. That could be a comeback, right? The car comes right back with the part burned out. So we want to try and avoid that, so that's where the resets come in. So if we would walk through how to do that, um, on our intelligent diagnostic tools anyways, there is a service resets and relearns quick link button uh, right on the front page of the vehicle. Now if you're uh, not an intelligent diagnostics tool, that's okay. All of the resets and relearns are still available through the individual modules on the, on the uh, vehicle. Uh, just not through that quick link service resets and relearns. So the capabilities will be the same. It just wouldn't have that quick link there. So if we go in there, we see that they are sorted by job. 
and the jobs are sorted by system. So we see the engine system on top there looks like 11 different uh, resets, relearns. And there, as I said, it's by job. So if I replace the oxygen sensor, that's what this is going to do for me. Uh, so that's the one I want to choose. So we'll go in there. And if we go in, uh, we have some top repairs graph data. We have our bulletins. And then we also have a quick link right to that functional reset. So if I click on that heater learn, it's just going to say on the next screen, hit reset. And it'll start the learn or it'll, it'll reset it. So if we hit continue, goes in, gives us some data as to what's going on with the heater circuit currently, the current currently. And uh, all we have to do is click this little reset button on the top of the screen, and it resets just like that. Because all it's doing is just taking the computer and telling it, okay, let's go back to where we started. And all the oxygen sensors at the same time, too, do, do that, by the way, and then they'll all learn accordingly where they need to go. All right. So it's better to start low and, and finish high than to start high and, and, and work our way down, right? So... So that's uh, resets. Like I said, fairly simple. Usually it's just a quick click of a button and it resets things back to, let's call it a factory default setting. Next one's relearns. So relearns are similar. I mean, all of these are, are fairly similar. We're doing something inside the computer to change it. Uh, but relearns are used to teach the ECM parameters of a replacement part. For example, throttle body relearn, valve body relearn, or TPMS. If we think about a throttle body relearn, Every throttle body that the factory makes is going to be slightly different. It's going to have slightly different characteristics. The gearing is going to be slightly different. The motor, uh, how fast it actuates the throttle on a drive-by wire, that's going to be a little bit different. Maybe it's a slightly different tolerance. You know, everything changes just a slight bit, but that's all it needs um, in order to screw up something on the vehicle. So this teaches the ECM how what the parameters of the part are. So an example of a throttle body relearn, usually you'll put it on, you put it in the sequence, it'll go to 100%, it'll go to 0%, and find out where that is. What is the range of this valve, you know, the flapper valve, the, the, the butterfly valve in there, what is the range of that? And then it, it, not, it now knows where 0% is and 100% is, so it opens and closes it a couple times. Uh, valve body relearn, same type of thing. You, you can put it in a learn mode where you drive it down the road and it learns where the shift point need to be. TPMS, if I replace a tire pressure monitoring sensor, which you do have to do, right? They have batteries inside that can die. So when you replace it, you have to tell the computer or teach the computer where that is on the car and then what the frequency number or the, the, the channel number. It's They all transmit on the same frequency, but what is the individual number of that sensor? All right, so it needs to learn that sensor so it can listen for that sensor or try, try to be able to, to see the, the, the transmission from it. All right. So example, let's do a thr throttle body on a 2012 Nissan Murano. So we go into service resets and relearns once again. And we see we have fewer, but there's fewer resets on this vehicle. So we have perform idle learn procedure or replace and relearn throttle body. Either way, we get to the same thing in this case. Uh, we'll do that idle learn. And uh, once again, top repairs, TSBs, and an idle air volume learn is where we're going to go. So if we click on that, it says idle air volume learning is a function to learn the idle air volume that keeps the engine idle speed within the specific, specific range. It must be performed under any of the following conditions. Actual vehicle applications may differ, but each time the intake air control valve is replaced, uh, throttle body is replaced, or the ECM is replaced. So idle speed or ignition timing is out of specifications is another reason. Okay, so let's say we did a throttle body. We've got to, re got to redo this. So continue. First, we need to perform an accelerator pedal release position learning. So we need to make sure the accelerator pedal is fully released. So foot off the pedal. Take the ignition, turn the ignition switch on, wait at least two seconds. Turn the ignition switch off and wait at least two, 10 seconds. Turn it back on and wait 10 seconds, or ten, two seconds, turn it off and wait 10 seconds. All right, so key on, key off for a certain number of seconds. That teaches the, the uh, with the pedal released. Then the throttle valve close position learning. So make sure the impedal, uh, accelerator pedal is fully released. Turn the ignition switch on and wait at least two seconds. Turn it off at, for at least 10 seconds and then confirm the operating sound of the throttle valve during the 10 seconds. So you should be able to hear it opening and closing that throttle plate to order in order to figure out where zero and 100 are. Go in there. 
So perform, before performing the idle air volume learn, make sure that all the following conditions are satisfied. And this is where usually we could have an issue here um, with, uh, with performing this test. Uh, because all of these have to be met in order for this to uh, in, in order for this to happen, right? So learning will be canceled if any of the following conditions are missed for even a moment, for even a fraction of a second. So battery voltage, more than 12.9 volts at idle. So if it goes uh, to 12.8 volts, problem, right? So we want to make sure that our alternator is working, I guess, because that's at idle with it running. Engine coolant temperature, 158 to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So it has to be warmed up. Gear selector needs to be in park or neutral. All electric loads off, and that's all electric loads, right? ACs off, headlamps are off, rear window screen defoggers are off, cooling fans are off, the radio is off. All right, we want to make sure nothing is on on the vehicle, including daytime running lights. So it says for vehicles equipped with daytime running lights, set the park brake and the lights should go off. So we want to make sure those are off as well. Steering wheel straight ahead position and centered. Vehicle speed stopped at zero miles an hour. Transmission needs to be warmed up. So drive the vehicle for 10 minutes. We want to make sure the vehicle is warm and the transmission is warm. Key on engine running, idle not excessively high. It doesn't tell us what excessively is, but I would imagine anything over maybe 1,500 RPM would be considered excessive. And all non-idle related codes cleared or repaired. So anything not related to this actual repair we did needs to be fixed. So we'll hit continue. Come in here. And if all conditions are met, key on engine running, select continue to start the test. Wait for the test completed screen. Okay, so we'll go in there. Test is in progress, please wait. And it's done, right? So it'll either give us a pass or it'll give us a fail when we go through that. All right, so it'll say the test is complete and you're good to go. Or it says one of the parameters didn't work out like we said we had to. Uh, so we're gonna do that again, right? So you have to go through it again. So that's relearns. Next one is coding. So coding is similar to a relearn. Uh, it's used to teach the ECM parameters by using some sort of a code number, hence the coding. Uh, examples are fuel injector coding. If you were with us at the very beginning, showed a quick video on how we would do that on a Ford uh, injector coding. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to do that on a Sprinter here in a little while. Uh, or proxy alignment. Proxy alignment seems to be a popular topic uh, lately uh, for some reason. Fiat thought it was a, a good idea to do this proxy alignment thing uh, when you replace modules. So that is a capability of the scan tool. And let's talk a little bit more about that right now. Uh, so this is just some uh, information on what that is. So the body control module stores and compares vehicle configuration data with the instrument cluster, as well as with other electronic control units in the vehicle. This process is referred to as programming of configuration of systems integrated, or proxy, P-R-O-C-S-I. P-R-O-C-S-I, also known as proxy P-R-O-X-I, which is how you would see it on the tool. If a, configura if a configuration mismatch is detected, the BCM sets a DTC. A configuration mis mismatch DTC will require the performance of a restore BCM proxy configuration routine or a proxy configuration alignment routine using a diagnostic scan tool. All right, so how would we do that? So in this case, we would not find it in service resets and relearns because it's actually its own function right here on the main menu. If we look all the way down the bottom under body controls, there is this proxy alignment right here. So this allows us to do that. We can click on it and then we can either perform the procedure or stop communication to restart. So we'll go to perform the alignment. And the procedure is used to display the proxy configuration status of the entire vehicle and then copy the proxy configuration data into any required ECUs. Continue to display the current vehicle status. So we'll hit continue and see what's going on. Current status. Instrument panel cluster looks like it's not programmed. Radio is not coded either. Uh, so tire pressure monitor is configured and the CTM is configured. So we would hit continue. And then to complete the process, turn the ignition off now, wait for the display countdown timer to finish. We walk through the steps and the proxy alignment procedure is completed. It doesn't take very long. Uh, basically it's, it, it queries through the whole network, sees who is set up and who is not set up. The ones who are not set up, takes that information from the BCM and writes it to those modules. It's a coding procedure. It's called a coding procedure is the way they call it. All right, so once it's complete, it's complete. Next we get the programming. 
Now, programming seems to be where the waters might start getting a little muddy, right? And that's there's some companies out there that say, oh, yes, this is a programming device when they're talking about a flashing device. And that, that like I said, that's kind of where it gets a little confusing, right? So programming uh, in, the, in the way it's used is used to change the ECM parameters. This is most often used in body control. It can be used in engine and other modules as well, but most often it is in body control. So I'm going to program the computer with the options that I need to put in there. So for example, if I press the unlock button on my fob, do all the doors unlock or does just the driver's door unlock? Does my alarm chirp answer me back when I arm the alarm or do I leave it silent, right? These are things that can be set up. We're going to walk through a few of these examples both now and then when we go live. So here's an example on a Sue room. We'll look a little bit more in detail on these settings a little later. Uh, but for auto lock time, right now it's set at zero seconds. So all I have to do is hit edit. I can go in there. I can choose from whatever the programming of the computer allows me to do. So I can't set it for 12.3 seconds. I can only set it for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, right? So these are selections that the manufacturer are allowing to be changed depending on what they are. Uh, so in this case, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, what have you. So we'll choose 20 seconds. And then once 20 seconds is selected, we can hit program and it programs it into the list. Now the list, this isn't done yet. We also have to hit program on the top there in order to program it into the computer. All right, so that is programming. I'm selecting from a preset set of parameters and I'm programming the, the computer to read them in that way. All right, so I can turn on additional modules on there. I can change my headlight types, those types of things. Well, like I said, we'll talk more about that in a minute when we go live on the tool. And then we get to flashing. Now flashing really is the most complex procedure that we're gonna talk about today because there is generally special equipment involved and things like that. So flashing is used to write software to the ECM. So examples, it might be when I get a blank module, if I have to replace a whole ECM on a Jeep, oftentimes Chrysler ships them pretty much blank. Maybe they have a few setup files on it, but for all intents and purposes, this is just a blank bunch of chips. So we have to write that software into the, into the tools. So we'll call that flashing, right? If you think way back in the day, like proms, right? You would take a prom out of the ECM and put a new prom in. That's like flashing, except we're taking a blank prom and putting the software on in a prom without having to take it out, right? So we don't have to physically remove anything. We're actually doing it electronically with the ones and zeros. Or software calibration changes. That's probably your most common reason. So other than replacing a module, actually doing a calibration change. There's thousands of TSBs out there where the solution to a, pro a drivability problem with a car or some other problem with a car is just let's flash it. Right, so we just have to reflash the computer or flash the computer. You can call it either way. There is specialized equipment needed to do this. Scan tools, you can't do it inherently with the scan tool itself. Right? Uh, most manufacturers require at least like Windows 10, which Okay, fair enough. Um, but, you know, Android, not available. Uh, any other operating system that might be used, like our SMX, not available. Uh, they do require, generally, they're on Windows 10 at least. Sometimes it was Windows 7, Windows 8. Uh, but now, pretty much those are by the wayside. So now we're up to Windows 10, so that's good. Um, certain manufacturers only allow Intel processors. Some manufacturers only want AMD processors. Some manufacturers will go with both. Some manufacturers want four gigs of RAM. Some want eight gigs of RAM. Different hard drive sizes. Some manufacturers don't play nice on the same hard drives. Certain manufacturers, if you install them in the same partition, they'll corrupt each other's data, and then neither of them will work. All right, so oftentimes you need more than one laptop if you want to do multiple vehicles. So that's a that's a good investment there. And then of course you need a J2534 compatible device, which is what we show on the left there, Pass Through Pro. Uh, here's an example from Ford of just here's just Ford's requirements, right? So um, if we have a problem using the Ford software, here are the top reasons why we might have a problem. Number one reason is Windows Firewall and Defender. So I can't use the built-in firewall or built-in antivirus on my computer for that. I can't use third-party antivirus software either according to this. 
Internet Explorer configuration. So Internet Explorer is also the only uh, web browser that Ford allows for this as well. No Chrome, no Safari, no Firefox. All right, only Internet Explorer. And then if we go through, um, configure Internet Explorer 11 using the following 15 steps. So it has to be Internet Explorer 11. And there's 15 steps to set it up just for Ford. And that's to set it up for the Ford way. And then GM wants a certain version of Java. And then another manufacturer wants a certain version of Adobe something or other. Uh, you know, so there's all these various configurations that need to be done in order to even carry the process out. And then there's also every manufacturer is different with how much they charge and how they do it. All right. So for example, Audi VW, it's $130 a week per brand. So if you want to do Audi, it's $130. Bucks. If you want to do VW, it's $130. Bucks. Acura, it's $30 bucks for a day. Uh, most manufacturers have daily, monthly rates, and then yearly rates as, as well. Um, Hyundai, $60 a week, $75 per flash. So it's $60 a week just to use the software, $75 per flash that you need to do. All right. uh, Honda's $30. Bucks. And uh, it includes the flashes, right? So different. Uh, Gen GM's really different than anybody, pretty much. And, uh, oh, actually, Chrysler's doing it, too. Uh, but GM's $40 per VIN for a 24-month period. And you can flash it as many times as you want. Uh, on Chrysler, it looks like programming subscriptions, $35 per VIN per year. Right, so it's all these different ways that they have to do it. They also allow dealer-level diagnostics, many of them, uh, through the J2534 box as well now, due to that Right to Repair Act. Uh, and there's just another few examples here. Once again, Volkswagen, 130 per brand weekly. All right, 44.95 for Mazda. You can see the prices on there, right? So you need to know how much they're going to charge. You need to know all these different things. Uh, Subaru is usually an outlier too. Yeah, it's 75 dollars per flash uh, for it. They'll give you the software, but you can't flash it with 75 per flash. Or if we want to make it easier on ourselves, there are also tools out there that will help us, like this pass-through assistant that just came out. So it supports the brands on the screen, so BMW, Chrysler, Ford, GM, Honda, Acura, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes-Benz, Nissan, and the Toyota Lexus Scion family. Uh, so if you're flashing any of those, this pretty much does all, you don't have to worry about any of that configuration nonsense. It's pre-configured to work for what it needs to, uh, what it needs to do. And uh, the representative on the other end of the phone takes care of all of the flashing procedure for you. So you take it, it says self-contained container, you open it up, plug it into the wall, plug it into the OBD2 port, and then on the side here, there are a spot for jumper cables, so there's a battery maintainer. Yeah, that's one thing I didn't mention earlier with the computer and the J-Box, you also want a good battery maintainer because if that battery voltage spikes or drops, you could have a bricked module on your hands too, so you don't want to worry about that. So you call, you make an appointment, and then when it's your appointment time, they'll call you back. And once, uh, as long as you know everything's set up, the computer needs to be set up first and all that. Uh, then they will walk you through it. You know, a couple questions on the phone, and then they'll they'll just get to it themselves, and you can go on about your day. So that's a really nice self-contained, don't have to worry about it uh, type system for flashing. So just. Those are your options out there. So if, if you're, I know it's a big topic lately because uh, more and more manufacturers are tending to want to flash to fix their cars. So uh, it's just, I want you to be aware of all the differences. And there's often misconceptions out there due to that difference in naming convention, right? So just that's what we wanted you to be aware of. All right, so now we're going to go live on the tool. So we'll go in and let's see what's the first one I want to do. Let's do a uh, let's do the oh let's do the old standby um, oxygen sensor heater. All right, so we talked about that the reset on the oxygen sensor. Load my vehicle, and when we see the service resets and relearns, that's the best place to go. So we'll go there. Pull that up. Give it a try. Okay, and there's my replace relearn auction sensor right there. We'll click on it. it. Gives us some top repairs information, gives us TSBs, and gives us our actual functional reset there. Now, I also want to do a little bit of research on this. I want to see if there's, find out more information on this auction sensor relearn. So let's go into repair information. If you have ShopKey or Mitchell and you have a Windows based Snap on tool, 
This will link you directly with your account with Shopkeeper Mitchell. It'll log you in, logs the vehicle in, and it'll perform a search for whatever you're working on at the time. So in this case, the Tahoe. Since it's the demo vehicle, we got to plug a little bit more information in, but that's okay. And then we go to oxygen sensor replacement. Now, if I want to find out any resets, relearns, calibrations, programming that I need to do after the repair is done, best place to go is going to be the after repair information for my search term. So in this case, we have some. And all it tells us, the only thing on the screen, is when replacing the oxygen sensor, perform the following. Make sure you do a code clear of the scan tool, regardless of whether or not a DTC is set. So basically, it wants you to wipe the memory. And then oxygen sensor heater resistance learn reset within a scan tool where available. Perform the above in order to reset the oxygen sensor resistance learn value and avoid prop possible oxygen sensor failure. All right, so that's why we're doing it. Right from the horse's mouth, right from GM right here, it says, yeah, you need to do this. So you need to clear the codes to clear the memory and then do this reset. And you have to do it in that order too. So let's go back to scanner. Let's say we already cleared the codes. And we'll go into that heater learn. Okay. It says select reset on the next screen. It gives me my data while I'm performing the test. So where is the amperage set at this moment? And then I just hit reset. It resets everything back to where it started when it was brand new from the factory. And uh, we're done. And it takes that long. Just a click on the but click of a button on the screen and you can get there. So I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to pop in here and just see, hey, did I do any of this? Did I do any of these things on this vehicle? Did I replace a fuel filter? Uh, do I need to perform an idle learn? Did I replace the throttle body? Did I uh, reset the fuel pump? All right? Any of these things, do I need to relearn the CAN bus on this? All right? and this is not Chevy. All right? So any of these, these things, you may need to do a reset or relearn on. So that's available from that quick link menu all right so that's that so let's do a coding now so we'll pull a sprinter out of my history a okay, 2014 sprinter with a three liter diesel okay so the model code all right hit okay there we go okay so in this case on this vehicle we don't have uh the, the quick links service resets and relearns but we do have the service, uh, the resets and relearns and coding and all that will be inside the individual modules. So in this case, engine. All right, sim mode active. So we see that. And that's going to be under functional tests. So we have codes, data, functional tests, where we want to go. And then we have actuator test, special functions, and adaptations. That is a special function. And then first thing there is injector programming. Also want you to notice that we have DPF regens, compression tests. Uh, cylinder cutout tests, speed limiters, uh, throttle valve actuators, all of those things. So we're going to do injector programming. Though. Before continuing, ensure the key is on and engine is off. And then when replacing an injector, it's essential to save the QR code of the new injector in the engine control unit. This process ensures that the necessary correction parameters for the injector will be recorded in the engine control unit. These correction parameters enable the engine control unit to meter the injection quantity precisely. All right, so we need to make sure we code them when we replace them. So continue, the QR code of the injector consists of seven characters and is located on top of the relevant injector. Continue again, and there are all of my injector codes. Right? So all I would have to do to edit it is just hit edit, type in a new injector code, and then hit okay. Once I've done that, it tells me what the old ID is, what the new ID is. We hit program, and it'll program it. It'll say programming successful when it's done. Hit continue and you're done. All right, so if you'd replaced all six injectors, you'd have to do it on all six. If you just replaced one injector, you do it on one. All right, so that is coding. And one more, let's do some programming. So we'll go to this 2011 Subaru Forester. There are multiple vehicles that do this type of programming, and especially in the body control module for sure, uh, but other modules as well. I just wanted to show this because we just added this to the software. I think early last year is when we did that. Uh, once again, on the Subaru, it doesn't have the service resets because Subaru does functional tests in a really weird way. There's some special connectors you need to uh, get to under the dash on, on this vintage of a vehicle. So 
Uh, there's no direct link to it, but you can still go into the modules. In this case, it is the body integration unit, or they call it the BIU, or the body control module uh, for uh, normal people, I guess, right? Uh, simulation, of course. So we go in there and we'll pull our Subaru cam. Okay, so if we go in, we have functional tests available, and we have actuator tests and unit customizing. That's where we're going to go. So we need customizing. When using this function, all available items will display the current settings. You may change as many items as needed. To change a menu item, highlight the item, select one of the choices provided in the submenu. Exit to the main configuration or customization menu. So we'll hit continue. Okay, don't need to change my destination. Some options may not be available in all models. They might not have that option. Uh, and then here it is. All right, so things like auto locking time, like we saw in the presentation. Uh, power rear gate, do we have it or not? Uh, lane change signal, X mode, TPMS setting, does it have TPMS or not? Uh, driver's door unlock setting, either we unlock all or we just select the door. All right, so I want to select, so we'll program that. Uh, rear gate unlock setting. Uh, let's see, where are the ones on my alarm? So what we used to have, what we had to do back at the dealership, because this is a dealer level uh, setup here. Uh, if we did a factory install or dealership installed alarm uh, with an impact sensor, we'd have to go in here and do the security alarm, turn that on. All right, so we have that. So now the car knows it has an alarm. Uh, whether or not the impact sensor is set up. So we'll go in there and we'll say that it's supported. And then also on the impact sensor itself, whether it's uh, plugged in, hooked up. Uh, so we'll set that to support it as well. So those are the three things we would need to do at the dealership in order to turn it on. There's a, there's an impact sensor that goes underneath the seat, plugs into the CAN bus. If you, were the, if you were with me a few weeks ago talking about CAN, I mentioned that there's a module you have to plug in underneath. And this is the final step. You need to go actually go in there and program it. When you're done, you know, the other things like illumination control, uh, automatic or manual transmission, automatic wipers, um, keyless buzzer volume, right? So what is the answer back buzzer for my keyless system? I think I want to go around and inside my car and change some of these settings sometimes too. Uh, but here we are. So we have everything set. And all I have to do is hit one program one final time. It'll program it in, and then it's done. Do I need to try again? No, I'm good. And then do I want to review this summary? Sure, let's let's view the summary. All right, so it tells us what was changed and what was not, and then whether it was successful, and then I don't want to try again. I'm good. Okay, and then we're done. So that is programming. All right, so I walked you through a few examples there. Once we got the tool up and running, uh, that worked out pretty well. So... Let's talk about next week, because that is this week. Next week, we are talking about, the, the topic is fuel injector component testing. Uh, so we're going to talk about, really, it's more advanced component testing using things like amp probe and uh, pressure transducers, but we're using a fuel injector as an example, because we can test a fuel injector electrically with voltage. We can check it mechanically using a current probe, and we can check the, the it hydraulically using the uh, uh, pressure probe. So we're going to do all that. We're going to walk through using a case study of a vehicle that was a no start, and they diagnosed it by looking at the pressure drop on the fuel rail, and they were able to look at the pulse width of the injector and so on and so forth. Uh, so we'll talk through all that next week. Uh, same time, same place, 6 and 9 Eastern now. Yes, we changed the time. Uh, on the second session starting uh, last week, first of the year. Uh, and we will be streaming the second session on YouTube just like we're doing right now. So youtube.com slash snapondiagnostics. Make sure you go and subscribe to the page and hit the little bell notification bell. That way you will know next time we go live on YouTube. Also, uh, feel free to leave a thumbs up if you're watching us on YouTube. I'd uh, be greatly appreciated. That always helps. And then to register for the Zoom class, uh, you can go to snapon.com slash ot. To register for that all right so let me check questions real quick i'm going to bring up al here uh, while i'm doing that so it looks like uh we're pretty doing pretty good on zoom if you have any questions on zoom just make sure you hit that q a box and then on uh, uh youtube looks like chat is uh pretty clear too so uh on mondays wednesdays and thursdays my buddy al mccaskey uh does new customer training or new platform training we'd like to call it uh, so this is starting off with your new tool. 
So anything from turning on your Wi-Fi and getting that set up through setting up your free Snap-on Cloud account so I can set up uh, reports and screenshots and send those to the cloud share with my customers, all the way through intelligent diagnostics, code to completion. And then on the Zeus and Triton training, he also tackles guided component tests as well. So it's very comprehensive training. Paul's about an hour. Zeus and Triton, uh, those end up being about an hour and 45 to two hours because of that extra guided component testing training. Uh, so once again, it is free and it's at the same time. So six and nine uh, Eastern, five and eight Central. Go to snapon.com slash OT to register for those classes as well. Uh, with that, not seeing any other uh, any other things. So, oh, I, do, I did get a Q&A come up on Lenny. Oh, my sign-up sheet, it still says eight. Okay, I'll have to look at that, Lenny. Thanks for pointing that out to me. I didn't, I didn't check because I had them set up uh, for that, and then I changed the times on the back end. So uh, maybe that maybe that change didn't didn't get, uh, take effect on the front end. So thanks much for that. I'll check that uh, check that in the morning when we go back in there. So beautiful. All right, very good. So thank you all for spending some time with me today. Uh, hopefully, uh, we cleared up some of that confusion between all of those different terms that are being uh, thrown about out there. Uh, and hopefully you'll join me next week as well. Hopefully you'll join me for uh, other sessions and join Al for some of his training sessions as well. With that, uh, everyone, make sure you be safe out there. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next week. Take care.